Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I would love to welcome a good friend of mine, executive director of the Women's Center for Greater Lansing, Melina Brand. How are you doing today, Melina? I am doing pretty well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Well, first, we're going to start off with the mission of the organization. What is the mission of the Women's Center? Yeah, so our overall mission is to help women achieve their own unique potential. So that means like a variety of things to us. It's empowerment, it's health, it's growth, it's finding a job, it's a myriad of things. Nice. Now I'm going to take this back to the beginning of your uh, your time as the executive director of the Women's Center to a conversation we had sitting in a coffee shop. And I asked you, how are you doing? You're like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, (laughs) was your response. Or I I may be paraphrasing that a little bit, but that was the tone. So how are you now since that time? How are things? A million times better. I feel like I was just like thrown in the fire, but I guess that's the best way to learn. So, um, you know, I really found my footing, even though we were in the pandemic for the past two years has really helped me kind of like figure out the basics and what I need to do. And um, this community is so wonderful and been so helpful. So I'm really glad for that. So, well, first of all, like what was the year? I I mean, I know I remember the conversation. I remember where it was. I don't quite remember the year. When was that, that we talked? 2019. So it was just, right before the pandemic. So do you feel like getting your feet wet in this, in this moment um, when you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then the pandemic happened, you are able to like go, well, nobody knows what they're doing now. So it's a little bit of freedom. Do you think that was a little bit of the case? Yeah, I think it, um, it kind of took the pressure off of like, wow, I'm supposed to be doing this whole like thriving nonprofit when everyone was like struggling and figuring out how to make it work in this new kind of environment. Um, I was really like just starting to really ha- get a handle on it um, in like February of 2020. Um, and then the pandemic and we like all shut down. And then I was able to kind of focus on like, what are the basics of what we're doing? How do we do that? Well, and like, let's build back the other things when it comes to time for that. And it really allowed me to focus on like what three things I needed to do right then and there. And then I could start developing other skills around that. So I thought it was really helpful. That's awesome. That's a really good positive spin. Um, you know, just looking back at the time that it was. So what were those three things? What were those three rocks that you were, that you grabbed onto in that time? Yeah. So the first main one was really just focusing on our counseling um, programs and making sure that we had like supervision and all of our technology was working and that we were building up the basic skills that we needed to and serving our clients. Uh, The second one was like really tapping in on our monthly and annual donors and making that base um, like involved again and make sure that they're staying involved in a way that I don't think we were doing before. And then um, I really got a chance to hone in on some marketing skills too, since everything was virtual. I was able to work on that a lot. That's awesome. So going back, did you have any type of experience going into being an executive director in nonprofit leadership? Nope. I had supervised like two other people in my previous job. Um, And I guess I had a few classes in my um, master's degree that kind of helped prepare me for administration, but I was really at the board took a chance and they like could, they knew something in me was able to do it. And I am so grateful for that opportunity. Well, I mean, wh- why did you think that you could just jump into this? I mean, you obviously were like, well, this interests me. I've never done anything like this before. But what was the what was the 
the push? Yeah, so I was working as a hospice social worker um, in the cl- in a clinical setting and wasn't just doing it for me anymore. Um, I really didn't like being on the ground, like in a clinical sense. Um, but I found out that I really enjoyed supervising to other people and like have helping them learn the ropes about what was going on. And so I kind of took that as like a, a sign to do something managerial. Um, and of course I, in my heart am like deep in empowerment in women. I was raised by a single mom for most of my life. Um, and so when this opportunity came up, I had also been a client at the Women's Center before when I was going through my divorce. And I was like, this is something that I'm passionate about. This is a place that has helped me before. This is something that I think my skills could be used and grown in. And so I took a chance on applying. And here I am almost three years later. I know. It's it's hard to believe because, you know, pandemic years, either they're super long or super short. And there's, or, yeah. So that's that's awesome. And uh and you're feeling good. You're feeling good about the the flow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so you went through women's center programs earlier on in your in your. Yep. What stood out? You, I know that you said that they really helped you, but what aspects really helped, and that you wanted to maybe even expand on uh, going into your leadership role? Yeah. So. The service I utilized the most was the counseling that was on a sliding scale income based because I had lost my insurance when I was going through my divorce and I just really needed someone to like talk to and work things through and just like listen to me for a while. Um, and luckily there was an immediate opening at the Women's Center. So I was able to get in. Um, and that is kind of especially with the pandemic, it's really shown that people really need mental health services and not everyone has insurance or they can't afford it. And so um, that is something that I wanted to expand on when I started. And now, thankfully, we're more in an environment in our society to like expand on those things. Now we've really realized how valuable that is. um, And we are in a perfect spot to expand those. Great. So... And and also, you just mentioned that you were a social worker for hospice. So, so to, is that experience there really helping you formulate um, what you're trying to to do as the as the mission of the Women's Center? Is has that really informed a little bit more of what you're what what you're putting forth? Yeah, I think just having the experience as a clinician really helps me understand like what works and what doesn't from a managerial level. And like, I really understand what my staff is going through. Um, And working in hospice really puts your priorities in check, like what things are important in life. And so um, that was just a big help personally. Be like, don't sweat about the little things. It, It really doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, that is a completely different mindset, you know, being a, you know, hospice social worker and being able to take that. I find that very interesting um, that that was one of the career paths you, you chose. I don't, or maybe not career path, but you know what I'm saying? I think that's really, that's really interesting. So when you first started, um, as an executive director and you explained to me that you were scared in so many words, what were the next steps um, that you did to figure out, all right, who do I talk to about this role? Where do I find them? And how do I put all that information together? What, what steps did you, did you take to really try to, um, make yourself, uh, more into this role? Mm -hmm. I really kind of reached out to people that I started meeting from networking events and, um, 
started looking for other nonprofit executives, executive directors that were women or that were in a smaller role. And um, you introduced me to your sister, Andrea, which was really, really helpful. Um, and then eventually I met Tashmika from the Firecracker Foundation and she um, was probably the most helpful person just because like our nonprofits were similar in size and um, both women of color and both like going through this whole thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm so grateful for her friendship and her mentorship. Um, I don't think she truly understands how much of a help she was for me. Well, that's great. Well, how much stuff did you, uh, I mean, because Women's Center is, is, I don't know how old the organization is. Do you? 15 years. 15 years. Not, so, well, 16 was this year. 16, this is the 16th year. So um, in that time span, there's a lot of legacy things. What What were some of the things that, you didn't really expect that popped up or are things that you had to go through the, well, this is the way we've always done it. What, what are some of the, what are some of those uh, hurdles? And I use the word hurdle because that's just a bump and then you keep moving. So, so yeah. What, yeah. Talk to me about those. Uh, well, the main thing was that I took over for a founder. And so that is a whole like hurdle mountain in itself, just because like that is that person, this is the, that person's baby. Like they thought of this, they grew this, they started it. Um, so just like taking on the weight of like, oh my gosh, I have to do this well because this person put like their whole life into it. Um, and then another thing was, the Women's Center was founded by um, an older chapter of the Lansing Now, so National Organization of Women, and it was founded in 2005. So when I took over in 2019, there were quite a few things in the feminism landscape and the mental health landscape that had changed since they founded it. So um, there were just a few things that needed to be tweaked to, like, current problems and current standards and that kind of stuff. Um, and then of course there's always the, the staffing issue where there is a lot of people who are older than me. And I came in, I started at 26. I was only 26. Um, and there was like a little bit of issue of, wow, this young person is now my boss and they, she clearly doesn't know what she's doing yet. Um, so <laughs> That was that was a little bit of a hurdle that we eventually got through, thankfully. Oh wow! So talk to me about the the staff. What what does the staff staff make up? How does how does that how do you guys function as with bodies in the room? Yeah. So right now we only have me and one other paid staff person. The rest of us um, are volunteers or interns. Uh, I currently have 12 interns that I oversee, which is kind of a lot. Um, but we are in the process of hiring a um, counselor to have on staff, which is exciting. That means our staff is growing by one. Um, and it'll be nice to have someone here who can just like handle crisis things um, that isn't an intern necessarily. Um, but yeah, I have an office manager who helps manage like day to day stuff. And then I manage more of like, the fundraising and the communications and marketing and um, supervision and all that kind of stuff where Angie, I, I found out I couldn't live without her, without the work that she does. Um, and so she's super valuable. And then exciting news, we might be adding um, a fund development person. So we are growing and it's really nice to see. Well, that's, that's all attributed attributed to the hard work that you're doing so with this fundraising person uh coming on that means that that part of your job really becomes that that person's job and so what do you what do you expect to be to replace what you've been doing with the fundraising aspect um yeah well i've been doing like literally every part of fundraising so grant writing um, meeting new donors, cultivating those donors, asking, 
um, making a donation plan and a uh, monthly donator donation program, um, plus getting new, <laughs> there's just like so many things. And just having someone else who can kind of help me organize all that stuff um, and maybe can do like research to find new donors and then I can make the ask would just be so much helpful. So helpful. So would you, would you think that that's your favorite part is asking the donors is talking with the donors, doing the donor cultivation? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Asking people for money is always so intimidating. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite part is watching my interns grow through their process because they come in um, not knowing a lot and then I am able to like shepherd them through their program and through working with people and then hearing their client um, empowerment stories. It has to be like one of my favorite things. Well, talk to me about your internship program. 12 interns is a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you manage that situation? How do you get them? How do you, uh, um, how do you manage them? What, what's, what is your process with that? Yeah, so luckily we had um, a few contracts with Michigan State, U of M, and Central Michigan when I came in. Um, and so we are on their like placement list. And when they get new interns, they just send us like a few. And I get to pick how many I want. Um, I was maybe a little overzealous <laughs> with the number of allotments this year. Um, but we do have undergrads, uh, like bachelor's in psychology, bachelor's in social work. And then we have master's in social work, um, master's in psychology. Um, and I only oversee the master's in social work, bachelor's in social work, and then on any undergrad interns. So there's a few interns that are not directly, uh, that I directly supervise, but it's a lot of, um, time spent talking individually and then talking with the, to them as a group, I think it's really important that they all kind of share what they're working on with their clients and the issues that their clients are having so they can learn from each other as well. Um, so it's a lot of collaboration within my interns. So with that, do you, do you feel like you're able to use the the wisdom of your mentors to be able to um, be a mentor to, to the yeah. students. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of mentor reception. Um, but I think it's also really helpful that I was just in their situation like mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, I remember what it was like. I remember what those feelings were. Um, and so I think that, I'm able to empathize with them more than um, some older people or people who have graduated longer than me. Uh, and I think that that is really helpful for them too, because they can see that like, oh my gosh, this person was like just where I was and now look at them. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I think that's one of the key things is to be able to, have the discussions using your experience and not only that, but knowing what it is to be in their shoes at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, that's so crucial. Um, and, and the fact that you're, uh, just a little bit or not far removed from where they were, um, is, I think that's just another key aspect. Um, one of the things of, this 15 year organization that I do know of is that it held, a, it held several events and, uh, that, or they were a part of several events that they put on to help, you know, with the fundraising with talk to me about how you took over those events and how that's, that's worked out because they still happen. So mm -hmm. how was your standpoint with that? And, or, or, uh, how were you able to pivot into those as well? Yeah, well, it's really um, kind of awkward because I only got to do our two main events in person once and then it's been virtual from the pandemic. Um, so <laughs> it was kind of strange. I really relied on my board who was there previously, who helped 
really put these events together to kind of like guide me and what we needed to do and who were the contacts. So um, that was nice to have them. And then this year we are hopefully knock on wood going back to in-person events. Um, so we will see how I do then. <laughs> <laughs> Our event, do you, do you like events? Are they your thing? Um, I like maybe like doing one or two a year, but they are kind of stressful to put on and it's a lot of work. Do you have, do you have committees that are, that are built for these specific ones? Yes, we do okay. have a All board right. event committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's funny that I I asked that because I know there's some there's some EDs that do do all the events themselves, and it's like, holy cow, how do you oh, do gosh. that? <laughs> no, I'm a person who is very strict on boundaries as well, like work and personal boundaries. So I ha- am really communicative about like what I need from my board and my staff, and so I think that's really helpful too. Awesome. Well, that's huge. Because that's that allows, yeah, it, it really allows you to have that delineated point where you're like, oh, nope. And then same with your same with the folks you're working with. They're like, oh, okay. So I know where everybody knows where they stand. Yep. Speaking out about delineation points between um, what you do at the women's center and your your other life is I just found out not too long ago that you're an artist. Yeah. (laughs) So let's, let's dive into that because I think that's a really, um, it's a really cool aspect that allows you to create boundaries because you have an outlet. Mm -hmm. Uh, So talk to me a little bit about, getting into art and doing it and actually, you know, being, being an artist part of the time. Yeah. So it really started, I've always been like a creative person drawing and making things when I was a kid, a teenager. Um, But I really started doing it after I graduated and started working in hospice as a way to like, just take my mind off things um, because it's pretty heavy Um, And having something else where I can put energy into was really helpful. And um, I really started painting with acrylics during the pandemic. I had all of this free time where I couldn't leave my house. And I was like, well, I guess I can paint. Um, And I really got to like hone in my skills. And that's when people were really interested in buying the stuff that I was making, which had never happened before because I was sharing it more um, because Facebook was like life (laughs) during the first part of the pandemic. And, um, you know, with that, people really encouraged me to like, do, do it, go and sell your art and have it be a business. Um, And so I did. And I actually just got confirmation of my LLC for um, Melina Brand Art, the business. So that is very exciting. Um, yeah. So what turned into a hobby is now another job, but it's still fun. <laughs> let's, not, let's not call it a job. Let's call it a secondary <laughs> revenue source. <laughs> that way, because what you could do, and I, and I know that you've probably planned it, but um, how how are you planning to incorporate more artistic outlets into what you're doing at the Women's Center? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, we have. Um, we have a specific domestic violence support group that is centered on um, like art therapy principles. Uh, so that's something that we do already that I kind of wanted really implemented when I started. Um, and we started doing like crafts with socialization nights. Um, so we'll have a few uh, activities that participants can pick to do. And then we do them together while also creating like a, um, a bond and a socialization aspect where people can kind of work through some of the things that they're experiencing in everyday life. That's incredible because it's kind of like one of those two way streets for you. It's therapy for others as well as it's you at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, boy, best of both worlds there. (laughs) Yeah. It's so fun to run those. 
<laughs> I, bet, I bet. That's really cool. Now, I'm just going to run through uh, a few more questions or a couple more questions. But that, um, so over the past three years, what do you think your biggest success was? Oh, um, I think the, uh, my biggest success would be increasing our grant revenue by 300%, which is kind of insane thinking about it. But, um, I wrote a lot of grants in the past two years and we have gotten a lot of money from it. And I am very proud of that. That's amazing. 300%. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Did you have experience in grant writing prior? Nope. Wow. Pick that's, that up as go. <laughs> that's quite the skill. You know, um, I've seen some of those and I shy away from them immediately. <laughs> Not that I'm eligible for many grants, but yeah, it's crazy. Um. Over the past three years, what do you feel was your most important learning moment? Ooh. Um, I don't know. That's really hard because I've learned so much. Um, but I think I just had to like really learn how to supervise different people and learning that there are different supervision ways and ways that people learn. And I think um, figuring out what those were and how to implement them was the toughest, but like most needed thing I needed to learn. Right. Absolutely. And lastly, I know we talked about your art and how often you do that, which is wonderful, by the way. I, I really encourage anybody to go check out Melina's Facebook or do you have a website for that? You uh, Melina okay. brand and There you go. All mm-hmm. right. A plug for Melina's art. You got to check that out. It's incredible. I even have a piece. So mm-hmm. there you go. And so, um, other than the art, how do you decompress? What is your decompression method? Your key decompression method other than the art? Um, honestly, probably snuggling with my cats and just petting them. (laughs) Nice. How many cats? I have two crouton and carrot. Um, (laughs) the salad cats. Yes. Something about that motion and it's just like mindless movement. That's really calming. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, (laughs) I don't have cats, but I can, I can relate to that. Um, and so from you, are you a reader? Are you a, what do you, what do you prefer reading, watching stuff, listening to watching. stuff? Yeah. What, what is your, what is your, uh, guilty pleasure on that? Oh gosh. Um, or what, what, what should we watch that you've gotten a lot from? What do you recommend? <laughs> Um, well, I don't watch a lot of quality content. Great anatomy. <laughs> that, that, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just started getting into watching movies. I didn't watch a lot of movies as a child, teenager, early years. Um, so my friends have a list of a hundred plus movies that I need to watch. So I'm working through those. Um, and that's taking a long time. <laughs> oh, 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 I can sorely add to that one. So don't ask. <laughs> Just kidding. But don't anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Melina. For those who don't, oh, or well, we talked about your art and where to go to find that. But where else can people learn more about the Women's Center? Yeah, visit our website, womencenterofgreaterlansing.org, or our Facebook um, and Instagram by the same name. Um, yep, yeah, free, feel free to call us if you need any information, but most of it's on the website. Well, perfect. Thank you very much for spending a little bit of time out of your busy day and being on this show. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. 
Thanks. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to this program. Don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple weeks. And if there's someone you would like to know of or hear from on their journey, or if you'd like to talk about your journey as a nonprofit uh, professional, just email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here listening to this show, please subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a positive review. Thank you again. And we'll see you next time in the control center. Have a good one.